Welcome to the Money and Wealth Show. Brought to you this week by AmericanManganeseInc.com. American Manganese Inc. has a manganese deposit in Arizona, indicated 6.7 billion pounds, inferred 8.9 billion pounds, potentially the lowest cost producer of electrolytic manganese. American Manganese Inc. has a projected cash cost of 44 cents a pound. The metal trades near $2 a pound. Do the math. Trading symbol AMY. Visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 604-531-9639. Molycore Gold Corp has substantial assets. Magnesium deposit, inferred 52 billion pounds. Molybdenum deposit, indicated 1.9 million tons. Inferred 1.8 million tons at 0.087% MO. Past silver producer, average 182 ounces per ton. Trading symbol, MOR. Website, molycore.com. Or phone me, Larry Ray, at 604-531-9639. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. The Money and Wealth Show is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Here is Danielle Park. Hello, Kelowna. I'm Danielle Park, and I'm here with Mark Faber, international uh, economist and traveler, investor, author of the Doom, Boom, and Gloom Report. And uh, I was wondering as I was uh, thinking about this interview, something that has always uh, struck me is that you picked that name when in the 19 early 1990s? Yeah, I started writing in the 1970s because I didn't trust the research uh, of the brokers who were always uh, optimistic and bullish and so forth. But then when I started my own business, I uh, use the name gloom boom and doom and because every cycle that you've ever studied through history has those components to it yes i mean uh, you know it's not a question to be a perma bear or a perma bull it's a question that uh, markets move up and down for all assets whether it's real estate or equities or bonds or commodities and so you go from a period of undervaluation into essentially a bull market and then you go into overvaluation where essentially you have uh, more and more uh, people joining the party and turning uh, overly optimistic and then obviously when the maximum level of optimism has been reached the markets start to break and uh, then they go back into undervaluation and these fluctuations in markets have actually been uh, enlarged by uh, government interventions, notably by monetary policies. So you have a printing of money and then asset prices go ballistic, but of course not all assets at the same time. That is the issue. So one of the things that uh, in that cycle, where would you say we are presently post the credit bubble bursting, but uh, where would you say we are? Well, the thing with money printing is this, that you can uh, essentially, as Mr. Bernanke said, drop dollar bills onto the United States. And uh, the difficulty is for him and any uh, central bank to know where they create symptoms of inflation, which can be consumer price increases or can be wage increases, can be increases in the price of real estate, of equities and commodities and so forth and so on. So 97 to 2000, they created essentially unintentionally the Nasdaq bubble and then it burst and then unintentionally uh, there was a housing bubble and then it burst and in 2008 we had a commodities bubble and so forth and then in 2008 everything collapsed and we made in equity markets around the world in my opinion a major low on March 6, 2009 with the S&P at 666 and since then equities have performed reasonably well whereby again Within the equity markets, not all equities move at the same time. So lately, the economic sensitive stocks have done badly. But uh, what has done well since last November, December, are financial stocks and uh, housing related stocks in the US because they became very depressed. But mining stocks have performed horribly. 
And uh, that is the challenge for individual investors to be positioned in the sectors of the markets that go up and avoid the sectors that go down. So if I could ask you about the money printing aspect of this, because yes. as you were saying, there's a definite demand cycle that's at the root of each boom period, but then there's monetary intervention that magnifies it, makes it yes. much greater than it would have yes. been. So Correct. you saw a commodities boom in the early yes, part yes, of your yes, career yes. in the 1970s when you first came yes. to Wall Street. Uh, yes. What might be different or the same about that commodities boom versus the one that we've recently lived through? Well, basically, in 1970, if we take gold as a proxy, gold had been at $35 essentially since 1933. So it had uh, been uh, extremely depressed uh, compared to, say, the rate of inflation by 1970. And then it went up 25 times, uh, partly because of uh, the dollar weakness and partly because of money printing, which was hand in hand. And uh, I guess that, uh, you know, we are up on the price of gold from $251 in 99 to now uh, 1650 uh, in dollar terms per ounce. I think eventually we'll go higher, but exactly how much higher, I don't know. And it could be that whereas gold has grossly outperformed stocks between 99 and recently, that for one or two years, equities go up. Because as I said, when you print money, you create these explosions of inflationary symptoms. And it could be that stocks go up more. So I wouldn't necessarily be short stocks. But I think whereas last October and December, the markets, the uh, stock markets were very oversold. Now we're very overbought. And I would be very careful about uh, buying stocks right here. So back to the idea about the money printing you subscribe to a more of an inflationist than deflationist camp correct yes i mean i tend to agree with the deflationist that one day the whole system will cease to exist because it's just gonna like your computer crashes and then you have to reboot it there will be a rebooting of the global economy but between now and then you know what stages will you go through i believe uh, we will have more and more money printing. That I'm convinced uh, because the economies that we have at the Fed, they have no clue, basically. Okay, if uh, I just can, can yes. I just ask you about that? Because we've never had a period that I'm aware of where you've had this many governments and this many <laughs> central bankers yes. printing at the same time. You can look Correct. at Japan, you can look at Germany, yes. you can, but they were not concerted all over the planet. So at some point, what is the catalyst? Because it's a race to the bottom. Is it that the real people in, uh, or the workers, the proletariat, uh, rise up and take back power? Yeah, well, I think that you make a very good point because when you print money, and we have evidence of this that over the last 30 years, wealth inequality and w income inequality has grown dramatically. And you have now cracks that appear. The prestige of the financial sector is being eroded and people ask more questions. A lot of individual investors, they say the markets are manipulated, we don't want to have anything to do with it, and so forth and so on. And, but exactly what the catalyst will be, I don't know. Normally, what happens in this situation is the printing goes on. The middle class and the lower classes, they don't participate. The 1%, so-called 1%, I would even say the half a percent, they benefit the most because they own financial assets. They own real estate, they own uh, precious metals and paintings and this and that, all inflating assets. And one day, you know, the people are very unhappy. And uh, so to distract the attention, governments usually go to war. Hmm. Or they blame it on uh, some minority or they blame it on the Chinese or whoever it is that comes to their mind. And then you can have trade wars and you can have... Uh, uh, military action in the world and i think that will be a, an outcome but for sure that i guarantee you for the rest of history of mankind you will not have quadrillions of derivative products in the system this is going to be one day just going poof away a big enema to clean it yeah, all out clean all won't that be wonderful yes i think so yes and it won't have much damage on the real economy let's say i live in the north of thailand do you think the people in the north of thailand 
have anything to do with the derivatives in the world. We have only to notice the difference. So would you liken this period as much worse than what happened in the 1920s when yes. we led up to the big crash? This yes. time is much worse. Much worse. First of all, in the 20s, you know, America was a young country and uh, people had a different attitude. There was no social security, there was no Medicare, no Medicaid and so forth. So people relied on themselves and self-help. Now you have this entitlement society. You know, if something goes wrong, the government has to help. But the government precisely created the crisis in the first place and to rely on government help you will make matters much worse than they are already. But things that can't be paid for won't be paid for, right? At some point, promises have been made for entitlements well, that won't know, be paid for. The thing is this, uh, you can pay, but in worthless money. You know, that is, but then, of course, you have a poor economy and high inflation because the people that receive the entitlements, whether it's Social Security or Medicare con uh, benefits and so forth, or pensions, they get it, but in money that don't buy anything. But if you can exchange that money for medicine, water, food in your own country, yes, is that not can, liquidity? Yes, if you can, but you know, in high inflation period, what happens is that in the morning when people get the check, they all rush out to buy something, but nobody wants to sell it to them because they get the money and they know it by the end of the day, the inflation will have eroded the money. So the problem of very high inflation economies is that the shelves are empty. So the market ceases to exist. If I'm a farmer, I see prices go up, say, 10% per day. I'm not going to sell you anything. I'll keep it in the ground or I keep it out in storage. Or you go to a barter <laughs> system. Yes, yes. But can you imagine globalization in the world on a barter system? Well, I think uh, in some cases we will move to a barter system, yes, for sure. Yes, and surely we'd sure. be trading water and food more Yes, than I mean, I always tell, you know, we are in a financial situation today where the investor should not just ask, how do I make money? But he should ask, how do I preserve money? And what is actually safe? You're like, in a breakdown of society, you don't want to necessarily live in big cities. But in the middle of the countryside somewhere, uh, in the middle of nowhere, probably it's reasonably safe. So to have a farm somewhere in Canada, I mean, for me, the climate is a bit cold, but uh, say for other people, <laughs> it's agreeable. So well, that is something I would do. Um, something about Canada. I live in Canada, and you <laughs> travel here fairly regularly. Yes. And you are noticing about our real estate prices being quite high relative to Sky other prices. High. Sky, Sky high. high. And um, I noticed that there's a This good is also a symptom of inflation created by the Fed. Because it boosted the Chinese economy, uh, excessive liquidity in China, and part of it found its way here into Canada. Right, so I'm actually thinking, isn't Canada perhaps setting itself up for a very disappointing period where people are over-invested into non-productive real estate, are used to cheap money coming into the commodity space from stimulus in China and the United States, and now perhaps we're going to see the downside of that again. Yes, I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the problem is, as I said, these the money printing creates these bubbles, but no, not all at the same time and with the same intensity. And uh, we had first the real estate bubble in America. It came to an end. Uh, superimposed on that, we had the real estate bubble in China and Singapore high end, Hong Kong high end, and uh, Canada and Australia. Now in Australia, the real estate market has started to break down. Some banks have already announced large losses related uh, to real estate development. And I think, yeah, it will happen in Canada. The question is from what level will it happen from this level or from 100% higher and then down big mm -hmm. time. But it, of course, as I said, prices move up into overvaluation and then it goes into undervaluation. I don't think there is any value in uh, uh, Canadian real estate at the present time. But, you know, in this huge, collapse I'm talking about, and we don't know 